we're over on Moon. Uh, we're currently casting through the YouTube stream through his laptop to that screen. So, <laughs> it's kind of like the round trip time to the moon. Anyway, um, so all right, I'm talking about Lunar Rovers. Um, I was talking about what I've been working on. Uh, I've been I've spent a bunch of time doing robots. Uh, I don't need more of an introduction. So. Oh, this is going to be fun. Let's see how long the delay is. <laughs> okay. That might be awkward. Um, no slides? <laughs> yeah, tap it earlier. All right, so I'll tap it. This, this is the presentation. We've already heard about who I am. Um, what I'm going to be talking about, kind of a, a combination of historical work that I've worked on and uh, future work that's coming up, uh, a bit of both. Um, and then feel free to ask questions probably towards the end. Um, if you're entertained, uh, I asked someone, you can guess who, to generate a piece, picture of what an amateur chef, sailor, and salsa dancer is, and apparently you can be all three at once, thank you to Generative AI. Um, yeah, pretty stylish, yeah. Uh, uh, salsa dancing, you're talking about? I didn't say style, no, I just, just gave it the, those two words. <laughs> That's all. Um, so I'm going to be talking about the moon. And someone already in the audience asked me, why do we care about the moon? So that's a great uh, introduction to the first part of the presentation. We care about the moon for a number of reasons. Uh, if you think back 50 years, you know, we had the Apollo missions. We had a pretty exciting drive towards getting to the moon. And if you think back even longer, we've always been like, oh, look at those stars. That's awesome, right? So we've been pretty excited about it for a while. And we went to the moon, we got some information about the moon, and we're like, okay, we've kind of had enough now for a number of reasons. But I think we're at a point where we're ready to explore the stars again. And there's a number of reasons for that. We have some massive advances in launch technology, um, and we have uh, some real excitement and sort of competition around driving technology forward. Uh, and you can think about that in a number of ways. I think there's three core reasons we want to go back to the moon. We want to go back to understand a bit more about our universe uh, and what that means for Earth and the rest of the solar system and beyond. Um, we want to go back because it will drive and stimulate development of technology that is not just technology for the moon, but also technology that can be used here on Earth and anywhere else we might want to go. Uh, some of those things might be habitats or new power systems, those types of things. And all of that you know, comes down to maybe there's an economic opportunity, both in uh, using things on the moon. Maybe we'll find uh, future resources there that might be applicable to Earth. One popular one that people talk a lot about is helium-3. Um, and there's also uh, economic opportunity for exploring that beyond that and, and helping things happen here on Earth as well. Um, as I'm going to keep forget to press the slide too early, uh, this is going to have some really interesting transitions. Uh, so I think the really important message, though, is there's a lot of serious reasons why we want to go back to the moon, but we all just want to go back because it's cool. <laughs> like, that's, like, the only way we want to go back is because it's cool. Um, I, I, I don't know, I kind of had this realization while working on uh, Moon Ranger, which you can see a little tiny picture of on top of the moon. Um, like, stuff I've touched is going to be 250,000 bombs. Like, that's kind of awesome. Um, so hopefully I can share a bit of that excitement with you guys tonight. So going back to the moon is a big challenge. A lot of people are working on it. Um, there's people coming out of Japan, US, obviously, China, India, Australia, um, UAE, uh, a lot of the, that area. Um, but how are we going to get there and what are we trying to do? I think the, the sort of core drive at the moment is we want to put a permanent presence on the moon and establish a settlement. Uh, and so how are we going to do that? Because humans aren't really designed for space. Uh, these organic matters and vacuum kind of not so good. Um, so we need to sort of figure out options like robots and what are they going to help us to do? Well, first, kind of like when we first explored uh, places that we didn't know, things like Antarctica, we go out and we find where things are. We're going to make a map. Uh, we're going to maybe take some photos from uh, outer space, get an idea of where it is, and go in and get a more detailed map. So a lot of exploration activities. Robots can help support that. And once we go beyond the, the support for exploration, we need to get into this capability to uh, build things and create things on the moon. Because even though the new launch capabilities have enabled us to send rockets a lot cheaper uh, and a lot more frequently, it's still pretty impossible to send everything you need from Earth all the time to sustain a lunar cell. Um, so robots will help extract uh, and also process resources, construction, and eventually also support base maintenance. 
So um, this is some concept art that I found online, which is actually thinks a pretty pretty uh, good idea. We probably want to build some landing pads. Uh, we're going to do some mining. We have a power generation system, uh, and we're going to have some habitats, uh, which you can kind of see in back. Okay. Um, so obviously, I'm wearing a t-shirt says Element Robotics. Uh, I am currently the founder of Element Robotics. We founded. Uh, this company because we realized we can't continue to build space robots the way that we've previously built them. And that way is typically we come up with a bunch of science payloads, we design a mission around those science payloads, and then we build a robot that meets the specific requirements of those payloads. Then we repeat that process for uh, an X robot. We might use a little bit of uh, inference. So if you see you know, a repeated designs of Mars rovers, that there's a lot of similarity, but it's still a new mission and there's a lot of non-recurring engineering. So that means that every mission that we send is really expensive um, and doesn't take advantage of the opportunity to reuse a lot of the uh, materials, technology, and design. So we wanted to come up with a way to do that. Um, and coming out of Moon Ranger, we said, wow, we've got a bit of an idea about how to build micro uh, in particular. Um, and someone asked, what's a micro I don't think there's a specific definition for a micro I'm saying anything under 100 kilos. Um, maybe there's a size constraint as well. But this is sort of a size that you can send on a rocket now uh, that would go on a, a Lunar landing uh, company that's something built by the commercial lunar payload services contracts coming out of NASA. So it's fairly small, um, maybe size of a couple of chairs, um, size rovers. So we wanted to build, uh, take the technology we saw on Moon Ranger and turn that into something to be used on other missions. Uh, that was the focus of building an autonomous rover platform, and that's kind of our core focus, uh, particularly the software aspect of that. But to do that, we also need to support uh, building a lunar simulation environment because we don't really have enough data to be able to test. Um, rovers in their full capacity. We want to do that. A lot of the open source simulation environments and, and tools that NASA have are very limited mission specific. So we want to try and build that capability out so we can help a lot of the different uh, rover missions. There's also a bunch of challenges in building uh, space things, particularly around hardware software integration. Uh, and based on that, we've been looking at some ideas in uh, development and testing tools as well, which there's a tools underneath my name over there. So anyway. Um, so yeah, a little bit of history. I'm going to talk about Moon Ranger. Uh, Moon Ranger is an 18 kilogram autonomous lunar rover. It is uh, designed, built, and tested at Carnegie Mellon University uh, on contract from NASA. And its goal is to search for lunar ice. So uh, that's a picture of uh, an engineering model of Moon Ranger. It kind of, when it's set there, it's about that high. That's the top of the solar panel. Um, and when it's folded down, it's you know the size of the height of my laptop, maybe a little bit higher. There's a few different things about it. Um, it's designed to go for a single lunar day. So typically, if you look at the missions that NASA has put out before, they are long duration missions. Some of them were only designed to go for maybe 90 days, some of the Mars rovers, for example, but they went on for years because of the sort of engineering design and rigor behind them. In this case, micro rovers typically don't have enough capacity to keep uh, warm during the lunar night. Uh, so the current sort of technology, unless you're using radioisotopes, which you have to be like military and US government to do that, um, you don't really have enough energy from a solar panel and solar power and current battery technology in the space that you have in a micro -over. So that's why the, the single lunar day mission. Um, as I mentioned, moon range maps for ice. And uh, I guess the other exciting thing is we're going from a, a mission that costs billions of dollars to uh, a hardware cost of under a million Australian dollars, which is Still expensive for you and I, well, at least for me, I don't know about you guys, but um, it is not impossible, right? It's something where we could send multiple of them. We could send one and have it fail and iterate on that design. It's sort of more of this uh, more modern design philosophy. So I'll give you some eye candy. This is actually a picture of assembling the flight rover. It's very busy, nothing like the clean picture you saw before. Even though it's tiny, there's a lot of stuff you need to cram in. Um, this, in this case, is upside down on a bench with the solar panel at the bottom. Uh, we built a carbon fiber chassis at, in, uh, laid it all up ourselves uh, at the university. And that was both a structural component and also a protective component, obviously. Um, inside this aluminum box here, uh, we have a, a flight computer, sort of a high reliability computer and a lot of electronics that were built in and designed in house. Um, and the aluminum casing is designed for sort of thermal management, but also protection from radiation. Uh, that's a challenge for electronics in space. Down the front, we have some navigation cameras. Again, uh, we have the advantage of an atmosphere on Earth, which means that we disperse light, uh, and, you, and you don't get some of these stark contrasting shadows. On the moon, you can be in a place where it's really, really bright, and your camera will get washed out as if you're pointing at the sun. And then right next to it, you have a spot that's really, really dark, and you can't actually see anything, because there is no dispersion of light. Um, 
extraordinarily little. Um, so we had to design a system to manage uh, that. And we'll see how effective it is. We think it's pretty good, but uh, there's always a challenge without having actually been there. Um, we want to have an autonomous rover for a number of reasons, primarily for speed, because we, have, we want to complete a lot of things in a single lunar day uh, mission. So we need a computer to do that. Uh, for anyone who's an electronics nerd, inside that box is a NVIDIA TXY, which is approximately a thousand times faster than the computer that's running the Mars rover. So that has teraflops of capacity, the Mars rover has gigaflops. So it's a huge step forward. And the reason we're able to do that is because we have such a short duration mission, the amount of radiation that this device can sustain is sufficient. Uh, it, it has enough protection to survive a short time for mission. It will be much harder to do that for a, for a longer mission like Mars rover, and that's why and last but not least, right in the middle here, probably what you have to see, um, is the NASA science instrument. It's a neutron spectrometry system. Uh, I'm not a particle physicist, so don't ask me exactly how it works. Um, but something along the lines of bouncing hydrogen particles from solar wind, some get absorbed, some get uh, reflected. You can tell how much uh, hydrogen is in the ground, or water ice is in the ground, by the difference in measurement on two tubes in there. So well, basically an anode and a cathode, super high voltage. Um, there's only four of them in the world. We got to play with one of them. It's kind of pretty exciting. Um, the other one is going on one of the NASA rovers, and then one is already in space, and that's where we got the idea that actually there might be water on them. So where are we at with this? Um, Moon Range is almost ready for its mission. We started in 2019, uh, went through uh, preliminary design review, critical design review, and coming up to systems integration review, which was scheduled for the end of last year. Um, but had to be delayed for a couple of reasons, uh, one of which was we needed to do some more testing and improve the electromagnetic interference of the rover, and the other of which is that Moon Ranger was on the Commercial Lunar Payload Services Mission 19 Charlie, which was run by a company called Maston out of California, or Mah Mojave Desert, uh, and they went bankrupt. So we no longer have a uh, mission manifest for the part going from Moon uh, from Earth to the Moon. This is kind of something you'll see a lot in space. Missions get delayed, things get go wrong, and you kind of have to deal with it. Um, so we, we are looking for alternatives at the moment uh, uh, where we will fly. Basically, this was a contract to NASA. NASA has the rover, and they're like, we're ready to sign off on it as soon as we have the integration with the future lander. Uh, it may be on a future commercial lunar payload services mission that comes up, or it may be on one of the Artis, Artemis missions, uh, which will be a whole other challenge because that involves human space flight. Um, this is actually a picture of the flight article when we were wrapping the multi-layer insulation gold blanket around it. It's a super fine foil um, and some Kevlar, so pretty cool. Uh, obviously inside a clean room. For anyone who's a medical nerd, it's not a medical grade clean room. That's why we're not wearing like face everything. So uh, what's next? The exciting stuff to talk about is uh, what's coming up in Australia. So I'm not sure how many people are tracking, but the Australian Space Agency a couple of years ago now announced the uh, Moon to Mars Trailblazer program, which is designed to support NASA by building a foundation services rover, which will collect regolith, lunar dirt, uh, and deliver it to an in-situ resource utilization facility that they will provide on, a, on the same mission. Uh, ISIU stands for in-situ resource utilization. Uh, the goal here is to stimulate sort of Australian industry and get everyone excited in Australia about building stuff and going to the moon. I think it's pretty awesome that we can finally do that here. Uh, we have a, a space agency now, it's amazing. Uh, thank you to the people who actually got around making one. Um, yeah, super excited. And the planned mission for this is in 2026 on a uh, different NASA uh, commercial lunar payload service mission. The exciting thing about this, it's Australia's first lunar mission and about uh, two months ago, the two winning consortiums were announced for that uh, stage one of that grant. Uh, one is the EROSE consortium out of Perth. And the other one is the EPE and Lunar Outpost uh, Consortium, which is primarily based here in Melbourne with a few offices on the East Coast. Um, and there's a couple of Lunar Outpost people in, in the uh, audience as well. Um, so that's really exciting. Uh, Element Robotics is part of the Lunar Outpost Consortium. We'll be writing autonomous navigation software for the rover. Uh, and yeah, we're super excited to sort of bring the technology and experience that we had on Moon Ranger to a similar program with a, a, new, a new mission now, which is to extract regolith and put it uh, into a, a in-situ resource utilization facility. This is a picture of the uh, consortium where everyone is. Um, you can see a bunch of people there. Uh, RMIT is about a few universities, Lunar Outpost and EPE, the primary uh, grant recipients, and yeah, Element Robotics. 
So uh, what is stage one? Let's talk a little bit about that. Um, stage one is going from the mission concept component. So we have a bunch of requirements that, that were listed in the grant proposal, uh, including get some regolith and put it somewhere, which is basically the primary requirement. Uh, and then uh, we need to translate those into a concept for mission. Like this is the hour over, this is how it's gonna operate. This is what it's gonna look like. Uh, and then we need to translate that through to a preliminary design for the initial project. So that's phase one. Uh, at that point, the two consortiums will sort of compete with each other for best design, and, and that will be down selected by the Australian Space Agency uh, for the phase two to build the actual rover and go. So we're obviously trying to make the best rover, and we're going to make the best rover because we're the best. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, super excited to be involved in that. And it's happening here in Melbourne, which is at least some of it will be happening here in Melbourne, which is kind of exciting for people in this room. Uh, and then the only other thing I wanted to say was. You know, it's pretty exciting to look at where we're going. Maybe we can imagine a future where instead of sitting in this room talking, we're looking at into deep space and thinking about where we might go next. Maybe from our settlements on the moon and Mars, uh, with our plethora of robots uh, supporting us, we might be able to go into different parts of the solar system or even to another solar system. That'd be kind of cool. I think we'd learn a lot. I'm super excited about it. Hope you are too. Uh, and yeah, I'll take any questions. Yes. Yep. So the all the micro rover missions to date don't have uh, essentially a thermal capability to survive the night. Uh, everything else is fine. It's just the thermal capability. There are some pretty interesting things happening in that space, uh, like self-inflating pop-up tents is one kind of cool. Um, and there's also some really interesting materials that are not nuclear radiation based uh, in terms of supporting uh, heat uh, and sufficient densities of batteries to survive. Well, so then, yeah, so, so the, uh, I don't know what the launch cost is, the sort of the typical cost for a commercial lunar payload services lander, uh, like the spacecraft, I should, probably should have explained this, uh, a rocket could be a SpaceX rocket, could be something else, launches a spacecraft into Earth orbit, uh, spacecraft translates to the, tra travels to the moon, drops on the moon, stuff drops off, or they do science on the moon. So there's kind of three components there. Sp uh, rocket launch, uh, landing craft, and then payloads, whatever the payloads are, in our case, rovers. Um, for the landing craft, you know, contracts are around 150 million US dollars, uh, and they usually have a lot more than just a rover on them. Uh, so, is it is it cheap? No. Is it cheaper than what we've ever put on the moon before? Yes, by a factor of ten or a hundred. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so for f NASA has, I can think of seven on contract commercial lunar pay payload services, and there's plans to have two or three more every year. Uh, if anyone's tracking the news, the Japanese uh, uh, ice base is basically a similar size landing craft. That was the one that uh, tried to land two weeks ago, someone who's tracking news, and crashed. Um, and there's a couple of companies around the world. Uh, Bereshit 2 is another mission coming out of Israel, and then Chandrayaan 3 is another mission coming out of India. Um, similar sort of size. I guess so. Um, I suspect what will end up happening is that when we get to the point of having a lunar, se lunar settlement, they'll start reusing the materials. I, I also don't know that, well, it's interesting to think about which technologies are going to break from the coal. Batteries is definitely one of them. Um, but if you were able to supply power from something else, then I don't think, maybe computers will die from radiation. A lot of time. Yeah, lots of isotopes. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Right, right. So we would, yes, we have the opportunity to be able to do that. Um, Mars Rover does drive pretty autonomously, so they, they've been able to strip down the autonomy algorithms pretty well. Um, we have the opportunity to do that primarily because of the mission duration and total radio. So the sort of general principle goes, the smaller the computer architecture, so we're talking about silicon wafer size, chip size, 
um, the more likely it is to get affected by radiation. So you need to find the right balance between the amount of radiation that your device can sustain uh, for the particular mission that you're working on um, and the compute power. And typically, you'll find for a lot of the bigger, longer duration missions, they end up going to field program or gateways or FPGAs because they have the time to develop custom algorithms for each of those, and it's a much more robust architecture. But if you're trying to do something quick and fast, it's really hard to get all your autonomy algorithms on an FPGA. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. So you, that's, this is basically what you do. You put as, as much uh, as you can on there. Uh, we were calculating 2.5 millimeters of aluminium around the entire, like all of our structures. Uh, unfortunately, there's this problem of like weight trade-off. So you know, we were very close. Like for context, we have you know two kilos of wires on there. Like all the things you don't think about, and suddenly your weight is going up. We actually had to cut the wheels down. To be enough to get us within the weight margin, like, like you're you're trading grams here, right? And so, at some point, you say, "What's the duration of mission? Okay, how do I protect from radiation? Can I use some fancy materials?" That sort of is that the trade-off. Cool. Yeah. Do you think like Starship is going to be So Starship is 100 percent going to be a game changer. So for context, um, when we get the launch capability of Starship, we're going up like a hundredfold in weight capability to get. Things into space and to the moon, particularly. Um, maybe it's even a thousand fold. I'm going to have to calculate that. I haven't actually looked at, but it's a it's a massive, massive change. Yeah. And even anything that's close to competing is like, uh, it's a, the, the latest like rockets out of Blue Origin, uh, a tenth the size. It's a tenth the cost as well. So it's a good trade off. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the Trailblazer mission. Well, both the missions that I talked about today will be polar because they're looking for areas where there is likely to be ice, um, and that's just from the previous missions that measured from like an orbit around the moon. Um, the specific location is very dependent. Uh, the Trailblazer one is not, to my knowledge, disclosed. Um, I don't know. We know it's polar. That's about it. Um, and then the one for Moon Ranger that was we were actually part of the selection process for the area, uh, it's an area of the Hayworth Crater that we were looking at, um, and that was. A combination like where is it safe enough to land? There's not too many big obstacles. We should be able to get a lander in there, but it's close enough to things that we want to be interested in because unfortunately the areas where we think it's interesting scientifically are also not the best places to land a spacecraft because they're typically but lots of craters and all these things. Um, so we you want to be close enough but not too close and sort of go through this process. You also have to think about the lighting conditions. Uh, in the polar region, the light doesn't really go above. It's, it's kind of like being in the northern territory, like right in the north or at the south pole. Um, the light's always on the horizon. And so you want to think about, am I going to get occluded? Where am I going to get occluded? Do that analysis as best you can with the data you have available. Yeah, so the, the data come ba comes back typically through the deep space network. Um, so essentially, you have a ground station here on Earth, uh, and that connects to a, a series of satellites. Uh, the primary one for long distance space stuff is deep space network, it's a commercial network, sort of commercial network. Um, it's very low bandwidth, like we're talking about 0.5 kilobits per second up speed. Uh, we were expecting about a 20 kilobit per, uh, yeah, 20, yeah, 20 kilobit per second down speed. So you have to adjust for that in your calculations. Um, not what you're used to with your fiber optic cable, but that's basically how it works. And then the lander acts as a, a beacon for that and broadcasts uh, Wi Fi to the rovers, actually. Um, s slide note because people are nerdy. Uh, when we were looking at Wi Fi, uh, obviously, Wi-Fi has never been used on the moon before. If you ever set up a Wi-Fi router, you have to select a region. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you select the region? And at some point, there, there was an application that went to the FCC to say, uh, we need to put uh, a Wi-Fi on the moon. Which region should we use? And there was discussion about putting a moon region in the <laughs> Wi-Fi standard. So just saying, if you see a moon, moon region in the standard in a couple of years, you heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I'll sure if the software is um, is there um someone wants to be used and collaborate right. Um so most of the previous missions that have actually flown are either completely commercial stuff that's flown on satellites and you have to pay exorbitant license fees for or are not applicable, right? Because it's a satellite, not a rover. Um, or they're government. So they might be NASA missions and Depending on who you are, you might get access to some of that. 
Um, a lot of the people that I know who are working in this space are basically trying to use research grade robot code, so I think robot operating system code, um, to build these. And that's what we did for our prototype. But at some point, we kind of said, it's not stable enough. We need to move to something else. Uh, and we moved to something called Core Flight Systems, which is an open source framework that NASA is providing for satellites and a bunch of other things. It doesn't have any of the autonomy stuff in there. Uh, and you have to kind of build that in. We had some challenges doing that. So I guess the kind of answer to your question is there's not really a broad consensus on exactly what to use. I think space community is tending a little bit towards core flight systems. There is a small community looking at uh, space roles, uh, which is basically how to make robot operating system version two a little bit better uh, and reliable specific to the space environment. Don't know exactly which way we'll end up going in the future. Right. Yeah. So we didn't have the weight basically to put redundancy in. We ended up with a two computer architecture partly. The original argument was partly for redundancy, but when you do a real analysis, you actually, this is not really redundancy. Like we go from having a capability of driving around autonomously to maybe having a capability to get like critical sensor data back. Like it's a very different functionality rather than a, a redundancy in that sense. Um, I think there is value in thinking about redundancy for some aspects, but in a size mission like this, it's extraordinarily difficult to get the redundancy you need in the weight constraints, basically. Yeah, weight, weight is a huge constraint. <laughs> so you might not have noticed, but the rover doesn't have like a suspension system, right? This is really, really bad for driving, and we had, we had to do a lot of testing to prove that. We just didn't have the weight for a rocket, right? Just didn't have it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 So we're planning for 14 days. It's the usable light is actually a little less than that. But yeah. 14 day missions is typical for polar region if you time everything correctly, right? Which you, which you try and plan. You also have to think about when you're going to send uh, your rover in terms of a radiation cycle, right? So the solar flux cycle affects the amount of radiation that you get as well, uh, transient. So that actually matters. Cool. I probably got, yeah, taking way too long time. <laughs> this, this is actually a good question. We, we didn't have that, uh, we didn't have that constraint imposed upon us, but um, I'm sure that, that as we get more missions, they will be more specific about where you put your assets because it's going to get crowded. Yeah. For sure. Right. Okay, awesome. Thanks. Well, thank you, Jeff. All right.